So um, thank you all for coming to our uh, seventh on the term. Uh, coming to the end, we've had a wonderful term of talks, but few can match what we're going to hear from Faye Dauka soon uh, on quantum gravity. Um, Faye is well known to the philosophy of physics community. Um, I remember her very well back in the 90s with a thunderous blow to the Consistent Histories program with Adrian Kent, that magnificent series of papers that you did, but uh, subsequently we would often meet in perimeter, as I remember, and uh, Faye has worked very closely with um, with uh, Sorkin and causal set theory as an approach to quantum gravity um, and is here today to talk to us about it. Thank you, Faye. Thanks, Simon. Um, so this is my first, my first seminar in person for two and a half years. So I'm really happy that it's here in Oxford in front of this audience. Thank you, Simon, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and I always look forward to speaking to the philosophy of physics, philosophy, um, my, my philosophy colleagues, because it's wonderful to give a talk where you feel that there's no end to the questions that people want to ask you. So it's always a pleasure to come here and be grilled. Um, the, what I'm going to tell you about is work that I've done with um, Jeremy Butterfield, who will be well known to you all, and it, it, there's a paper, so I'm going to basically summarise um, the paper for you today, and oops, so this is the plan of my talk, it, it's an argument, two assumptions about a quantum gravity theory X, and this may be a theory that a program that already exists, or it may be one that is yet to be created. And the two assumptions are that X recovers general relativity and that X is discrete at the Planck scale. I'm going to flesh out these assumptions in a series of comments. I'll in, and in the process of making these comments, I'm going to introduce two concepts, that of the grounding state and discrete, discrete physical data. And oh, and also the third, third concept, which is discrete continuum correspondence for the three X. I will then state and briefly justify two claims. The first claim is that causal sets, or a synonym for causal set is discrete order, can recover general relativity space times. And the second claim is that no other proposal to date in the literature for a discrete physical data set does the job. And I'm, you'll see I'll spend much more time on C claim, the second claim than the first claim. I'll ex if I have time, I'll explain why what you might call quantum uncertainty does not invalidate this argument. And then I'll conclude. Oh, right. So it, here are the assumptions again about quantum gravity theory X. Theory X recovers general relativity as an approximation in certain states or physical situations at macroscopic scales. And the second assumption is that the theory is physically discrete at the Planck scale. And here I've listed just some quantum gravity programs with what I would say, call a discrete flavor. Causal sets, causal dynamical triangulations, energetic causal sets, and entropic gravity. This is by no means an exhaustive list, um, but group field theory, holography, loop quantum gravity, spin foams, quantum graffiti, quantum regicalculus, space-time code, thermodynamic gravity, the Wolfram program, dot, 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 dot. And it, our argument covers any theory which aims to or claims to recover GR and any theory that is physically discrete at the Planck scale, the meaning of which I'm going to expound in the comments that are to follow. Okay, so here are the comments. It's useful to bear in mind 
externality, and there's three that I want to highlight. So one is that GR recovers Newtonian gravity as an approximation in certain physical situations, in certain states. Molecular dynamics recovers fluid dynamics as an approximation in certain physical situations. And this is particularly pertinent to the example of quantum gravity as, that I'm going to talk about today, because in this example, the continuum is emergent. So the theory that's recovered, fluid dynamics, is a continuum theory, but the underlying theory, molecular dynamics, is a discrete theory. And then the third example of a third analogy that I want to you to bear in mind is that quantum mechanics recovers classical mechanics as an approximation in certain physical situations. And here I want to hedge <laughs> because some people may claim that this has not been achieved yet. So, uh, and some people will claim that it has been achieved. So uh, it doesn't matter to the argument whether or not it has been achieved yet. So it, you can say either quantum mechanics recovers classical mechanics as an approximation in some way that's already set out somewhere by someone or in a way that is yet to be set out in the future. And X, in order to, the, the part of the meaning of X recovering general relativity is that X must recover some large class of four dimensional space times including gravitational waves, large portions of Minkowski space, black holes, expanding cosmologies. And all these recovered space times vary slowly on Planckian scales. They don't have any Planckian or subplankian detail. And then X has, for each of these GR space times to be recovered, a grounding state, this is new, new, a new terminology which we introduce, um, which contains, produces, or gives rise to a set of discrete physical data, or DPD, from which the space-time, the GR space-time MG can be recovered essentially uniquely. In other words, the manifold, the space-time, the space-time MG is a good approximation to this discrete physical data set. And I'll emphasize that the discrete physical data set contains, produces, or gives rise to no geometrical information about the GR space time at smaller than Planckian length, time, volume scales. Thus, as an example, this implies that a piecewise flat manifold cannot be a DPD set. Any manifold is a continuum entity if it's piecewise flat, then it contains continuum information. It, it is not a candidate DPD set. It cannot be discrete, but it's not discrete. It's not discrete physical data. I'll come back to that point. That will be important later. More comments. There must be a discrete physical correspondence or DCCX for theory X that says up to some tolerance when a GR space time is recovered from a DPD set, a discrete physical data set. And the thing that I want to remind you of here is the analogy of molecular dynamics and fluid mechanics. So the, the, it's the same idea here. The fluid state is recovered from the molecular state. In that way, in theory X, the GR space time is recovered from the discrete physical data set. The GR space time is an approximation to the set of discrete physical data. And that must be, it must be spelled out how that, when it is the case that the GR space time is recovered from the DP, is recovered by the DPD set. The, Essential uniqueness that I've mentioned already is, is necessary for this discrete continuum correspondence in theory X to hold water. So let me, let me spell that out a bit. If two space times MG and M prime G prime are recovered by the same discrete physical data set according to this discrete continuum correspondence, 
then the two space times must be physically indistinguishable on large scales. Remember the discrete physical data set, that is the physical data. That's what the theory gives you in the grounding state. So if you recover two space, two continuum space times from that, the same physical data, those two continuum space times must be indistinguishable on large scales. And in the same way, in the, our analogy, if two fluid states are recovered from the same molecular state, then they must be physic. Those two fluid states must be physically indistinguishable on large scales. This underpins the concept of recovery of one theory from another. It underpins what we mean when we say that quantum gravity is more fundamental than GR, because the quantum gra X is more fundamental. The discrete physical data set is the physical data. The GR space time is an approximation to it, and you cannot then recover two different physical. GR space times from the same physical data. No assumption need be made in this argument about the nature of the grounding state. It might be a state in a Hilbert space or something entirely different, such as, uh, I should have taken this comment out because it won't, probably won't mean anything to this audience, a co-event in a path integral based framework. Anyway, it, you don't need to, it could be a, a state in a Hilbert space, space or not or it may be something um something very different and we may the argument needs no assumption to be made about how the state this grounding state gives rise to the discrete physical data the state might actually just be the discrete physical data you don't need to do anything to it it just is the discrete physical data or the data may be expectation values of or eigenvalues of certain self-adjoint operators or not. And their deduction from the state could involve some kind of coarse graining or involve matter degrees of freedom or rely on more or less anthropocentric arguments involving observers or frames of reference or dot, 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 dot. We don't need to delve into how the grounding state gives rise to the discrete physical data. We just need to assume that it does. Oops, sorry. Uh, just two more comments then. We've been expanding the meaning of the two assumptions. What about superpositions and or duality? In general relativity, the physical world is a single space time, mg. So in assuming that x recovers gr, we are assuming that the singleness of space time can be derived in X somehow or other. We consider the discrete physical data set, the data that can recover one single space time after this has been accomplished, however it has been accomplished in a grounding state. And then the final comment is that the argument does not target the use of, for example, piecewise flat Lorentzian manifolds as continuum approximations to continuum geometries, nor does it target the use of a discreteness length as a regulator to be taken to zero in defining a theory in a continuum limit. So it, it, the two claims are that a causal set or what's synonymous with causal set, a locally finite partial order is a set of discrete physical data that taken as being discrete on the Planck scale can recover a GR space time as a continuum approximation. And the second claim is there is in the current literature no other proposal for a set of Planck scale discrete physical data that can recover a GR space time as a continuum approximation. And as I said, I'm going to say something very briefly about claim one and concentrate more on claim two as being probably perhaps more controversial. So before I do that, just a little reminder of what theory X, quantum gravity theory X recovers. So this light cone here is meant to remind you of, a Lorentz, of the structure of a Lorentzian geometry, which is very different from that of a Riemannian geometry. So people often say that GR teaches that gravity is geometry. 
I don't disagree with that, but it teaches that gravity is Lorentzian geometry, and that's absolutely crucial. And another way to say that is that causal order, the, or the, in other words, the light cone structure, is central to the physics, mathematics and physics of GR. It, you open a GR textbook and it's full of Penrose diagrams, which are di they are representations of the causal structure of space times. And the epitome of, of GR is a black hole, and that's defined in terms of causal structure. Lorentzian geometry, in great contrast to Riemannian geometry, is bordering on non-local. If not, if it's not actually non-local, then it's just not, it's really on the edge of being non-local. And the notion of physically close is is not captured well in any picture. And, that, and that's because the Euclidean geometry of the paper on which you draw the picture or imagine even the picture is an impediment to understanding Lorentzian geometry. And here's an example. So it, I've drawn the point P with its future and past light cones. And if you draw the points, which are one Planck time, one Planck unit, of proper time to the future of P, then those points, the locus of those points is a hyperboloid of infinite spatial, infinite three dimensional spatial volume, which sits inside the future light cone and asymptotes to the light cone. And there's no limit to the number, to the, to the points which are one Planck time away from P. Those points lie on this infinite hyperboloid. And if you consider those points to be discreetly distributed, then there will be infinitely many of them and they will stretch up the future light cone and get closer in this diagram, closer and closer to them. Okay, so that's, that's what we need to recover. That's what X, theory X needs to recover. Okay, so the first claim is that causal sets, like a causal set, which is a discrete order or another synonym is transitive directed acyclic graph, can have a continuum Lorentzian space time as a continuum approximation to it. And the analogy is with the fluid approximation to the molecular distribution of molecules, the discrete distribution of, of molecules. So here I've just drawn a sketch, heuristic sketch. <laughs> Here is a very small causal set. It's a graph. It's a transitive directed acyclic graph. The arrow, the direction on the edges of the graph indicate temporal precedence. So they just indicate a microscopic notion of before and after. So D is before A and A is before B. The elements of the, of the causal set are space-time atoms, or another way to think of them is that they're the smallest um, indivisible events um, in the theory. And then as an approximation to this, there is a continuum, a Lorentzian geometry, and, and this, this tiny causal set can't at all indicate the complexity of a transitive directed acyclic graph that can underlie our space-time. In the observable universe, there are roughly 10 to the 240 blank-sized um, four-dimensional four uh, volume um, elements, and that's the order of magnitude of the number of elements that you would need in a, in a causal set in order for our observable universe to be a good approximation to it. Okay, claim one can be encapsulated in a slogan, which is order plus number equals Lorentzian geometry. And to understand, to understand this, I have to introduce the discrete continuum correspondence for causal sets. I said that in order to judge any theory which is physically discrete on the Planck scale and recovers GR, it must have a discrete continuum correspondence. It must tell you when a space time is a good approximation to the discrete physical data. So here is the discrete physical discrete continuum correspondence for causal sets. So a causal set C recovers a manifold MG if 
C, phase three embeds in the manifold at Planck density. So what does that mean? That means that there exists an embedding, a map from C into M, such that, such that the, the num number of elements that is embedded in any large physically nice region is approximately the volume of that region, space-time volume of that region in Planck units. That's the first approximation. This means that the embedding is uniform. So the, the, the embedding maps the points uniformly into the space-time according to the volume measure. And then the condition for this map, this embedding to be faithful, is that it respects the order so the, the, under, the order, order of the causal set, which is just the ordering relation that it has, must equal the causal order of the point, the, of the embedded points. So if X precedes Y in the causal set, then, and the map is F, then F of X must be to the causal past of F of Y. In other words, F of X must be in the past light cone. Of f and y, uh, of f y. So this, so this embedding, embedding must be order preserving. And, and as far as we know, condition, condition one, one, the number volume um, correspondence, means, means that the distribution of the embedded points must be random. Okay. So one, why do we? What's the evidence for this claim? And that, uh, the, only the only evidence I'm going to mention are these three points down here. They're really, They're really collections of evidence of different sorts. So the first, so the first piece, of, piece evidence of evidence is a theorem. theorem. It's a continuum theorem. It's not, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't, it doesn't speak to discreteness at all. And, and I've come to, after attributing this theorem erroneously to various people over the years, I've come to the <laughs> this is my my best stab at the list of people who's who should be mentioned uh, who's whose, whose names should be um, mentioned when referring to this theorem. So it, the Kronheimer Penrose Hawking Malamut theorem says that in the continuum, this is to do with Lorentzian geometry, continuum Lorentzian geometry, causal order that is just the, the light cone structure plus the volume information, if you like, the volume measure tells you the Lorentzian geometry. And the order, and that underpins claim one, because the idea is that the order of the causal set provides the space-time causal order, and the counting measure, just the number of elements, provides the space-time volume. And th this idea that a discrete manifold contains its own metric information was um, mentioned by or referred to by Riemann in his um, in his inaugural lecture, and that's cited by Raphael Sorkin as as um, something influential on him in developing the causal set approach to quantum gravity. The second piece of evidence is that. At infinite density, so if the embedding is not Planck scale, but infinite density, then a faithfully embedded causal set, but if as you approach infinite density, so the density of the embedded points um, become, becomes arbitrarily large, then that faithfully embedded causal set actually tends to the manifold itself. Although that's it, it's a continue that's a continuum limit, so strictly, it's not a proof that it, it it's not a proof that away from the continuum limit, when the discreteness is physic has a physical scale and is not taken the discreteness length is not taken to zero, it doesn't prove that you can recover the 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 manifold, but it's certainly evidence that a continuum when you have a continuum limit, it's evidence that there's a continuum approximation close by. And then there's a whole slew of what I would call direct evidence where we take faithfully embeddable causal sets and we directly from the causal order, from the causal set itself, read off 
continuum geometrical information. For example, the dimension, geodesic proper time, and scalar curvature. We have ways, we have estimators for these entities from these of these geometrical quantities just from the discrete data itself. Okay, so that's claim one. Claim two is that no other discrete physical data set can do that and do the job. And what I'm going to do is illustrate one, one example of a discrete physical data set. And I'll show you that it doesn't work. And then I'll argue that nothing else, nothing like it can work. Okay, so the, here is my proposal for an, alter, so an alternative discrete physical data set to causal sets. And I've called it a combinatorial Lorentzian Red J complex or CLRC. So what is that? Well, it's a combinatorial simplicial complex. And by that, I mean, it's a simplicial complex without the continuum filling so it, it's a, it, it's just a combinatorial information about, it, it, built upon a set of vertices, a set of one simplices, which is just set pairs of, of, um, of vertices, um, two simplices, which are just triples of vertices, et cetera, which satisfy certain, um, uh, Conditions. The condition to be a simplicial complex is that if a simplex, if there's a sim, if there's a uh, an n simplex, then any subset, any n minus one um, subset of cardinality n minus one of that will, is an n minus one um, simplex. So there are certain conditions that these sets, that these vertices, edges, um, uh, and high, higher dimensional simplices must satisfy satisfy in order to be a simplicial complex. Plus, I'll allow in this combinatorial complex Lorentzian edge length data. So the edges of this um, simplicial complex can be decorated with a length, each one, and if appropriate, decorated with a future direction. So some of the edges might be space-like and they would have a, a length decoration. So if the edges are either time-like or null, then they'll, the, they'll be decorated with a length, but also a future pointing direction. And the, these, this edge length data is, for, in order for it to be Planck scale discrete, they're no more than a few Planck units. So no more than a few Planck times for the edge, the time-like, edges and no more than a few Planck um, lengths for the space-like edge, um, edge decorations. And let me emphasize that in this combinatorial Lorentzian Regge complex, there is no geometrical information in the interior of the simplices because that would be continuum information. And so this diagram, this sort of little cartoon that I have here of a geodesic dome is slightly misleading because you can see that the edges are represented by these struts, but that data is not there in the CLRC. There's no, because that's, con that's, that's a continuum, that's a, a segment of the real line and that has continuum data. So that, that's not there in the, in the CLRC. The only data that's in the CLRC is the pair of vertices at each end of the edge and uh, decoration of some length um, and possibly future pointing direction on that uh, for that pair. Okay. So here's a discrete continuum correspondence for this sort of data, discrete physical data set. And I don't claim this is the only one that you can come up with, but I claim that it is a natural one. It's a natural seeming one. So such a CLRC recovers a space-time manifold, MG, if that CLRC is the combinatorial complex 
derived from a triangulation of the manifold M. So triangulation is a piecewise flat manifold. Uh, it, the triangulation of M is a piecewise flat manifold, which is, which is homeomorphic to the manifold. So, uh, and if you have such a triangulation, that will be a simplicial complex. Um, and you can, you can take just the combinatorial data of that simplicial complex. So that's one, that's one condition for this CLRC to, to recover the space-time manifold MG. And the vertices can be, in, the vertices of this um, combinatorial complex can be embedded in the manifold consistent with that triangulation. In other words, the triangulation, <coughs> because the, the simplicial complex is derived from this triangulation, triangulation, which is what I will call a geometrical simplicial complex, there's a map, this homeom that they're homeomorphic. So there's a map um, between the, uh, uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence and a homeomorphism between this simplicial complex and the manifold. So it's an embedding, in particular, it's an embedding of the vertices of the simplicial complex into M. So the vertices can be embedded in M, consistent with that triangulation, that's what it means, such that the space-time geodesics between the embedded vertices have proper, this is the space-time geodesics in the continuum, in the, um, in MG, between the embedded vertices have proper lengths, which are approximately equal to the edge length decorations of the CLRC. Okay. And, it, and it, let's, go back, let's go back to this. So, so it, forgetting the Lorentzian aspect of, of, um, of this uh, simplicial complex for a moment, you can see how this will work in the case of the geodesic dome. So these vertices must be embeddable in, so this obviously looks like a hemisphere. So let's say that the hemisphere is our um, continuum approximation to this discrete um, data. So there must be a, an embedding of these vertices into the hemisphere such that the actual geodesics on the hemisphere, the lengths of them are approximately equal to the edge length decorations of the um, of the corresponding edges in the in the um, in the complex and if that's the case then we say that the continuum geometry is a good approximation to the discrete data set okay so I claim that that's a natural discrete continuum correspondence for these CLRCs however it fails it doesn't work. It, it, it seems like a sensible idea, but it fails. And it fails in the following way. There exists a CLRC that according to this discrete continuum correspondence recovers Minkowski space. And it also recovers the space time that's a perturbation of Minkowski space with a physical macroscopic plane fronted gravitational wave burst. So I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to demonstrate this, this discrete physical data set. It's a, it's a combinatorial Lorentzian red J complex. And I'll show that it, according to this um, discrete continuum correspondence, it recovers Minkowski space. And I'll show you that it also recovers this um, gravitational wave space. -time. Okay, so the example is based on the integer lattice in three plus one dimensions. And I've just drawn one plane of the integer lattice. So this is just the integer lattice in, in one plus one dimensions. And you're to think of it being, being um, uh, translated in the, in the X and Y direction. So this is just the TZ plane. So the triangulation of Minkowski space is you take each of the hypercubes in it that is um, constructed from this integer lattice, and you can triangulate it. There's a standard way that you can triangulate it um, into, I can't remember how many 
um, how many simplexes there are in, the, in each cube. But there are 15 edges from the origin in hypercube one. Oh, 24. I wrote it down. That's the cover of me. So there are 24 four simplexes in each hypercube. There are 15 edges from the origin in hypercube. So I've drawn two example hypercubes here. The one that's um, it, it, it sits at the origin of coordinates. That's hypercube one. And then hypercube two is, is ignore the blue stuff at the minute. Hypercube two just um, is one, one unit of time upwards above it. Uh, and in each hypercube, 15, there are 15 edges from the origin that start at the origin and go to one of the other edges, uh, one of the other vertices. Um, one of those edges is time-like. In hypercube one, it's the obvious one. It's just the one that starts at the origin and goes straight up. That's the only time-like um, edge. Three of them are null and the others, the other edges, um, the other 11 edges are space-like. The CLRC is the combinatorial complex that's formed from this, what I call geometrical complex, uh, simplicial complex, this triangulation of Minkowski space with the, the edges decorated by their Lorentzian lengths in Minkowski space. So um, the, the length of this, which is one time-like unit, the length of this is one space-like unit, the null edges have zero, um, have zero lengths, etc. And now draw your attention to the blue shaded region. And again, think of the blue shaded region as being a slab. So this is the, the just the TZ plane, but it's, it's translated um, in the X and Y directions as well. In that slab, there are no vertices. It's a void. We think of it as being the open, it's the open region. So it doesn't have, it doesn't contain its edges. So, so there are no vertices in that slab. It's, it's what I call a void. It's void vertices. Okay. Just to emphasize again that there's no geometrical information in the interior of any of the simplicities. That information is not there. It's not, if, the, if that information were there, then this data would just be Minkowski space. It would be all these flat pieces that fit together perfectly and make Minkowski space. And that's not discrete. It's Minkowski space. That's a continuum manifold. It has continuum information, all the continuum information. And that's not allowed as a discrete physical data set. So the, it's discretized, fully combinatorial data. It's just the, the vertices, the connectivity of those vertices um, with the edges and the length decorations of the edges. That's it, that's, that's the data that you have. So the discrete, the discrete continuum correspondence for CLRCs says that this CLRC recovers Minkowski space. It, the vertices are embeddable in Min because that's how you built it. The vertices are embeddable in Minkowski space and they're embeddable in such a way that the, the length of the, of the geodesics between the embedded vertices, in fact, in this case, exactly equal the length the decorations, the length decorations, because that's how you chose the length decorations. So it's, you know, it's, um, it's no surprise at all to say that this, to claim that this CLRC recovers Minkowski space by the discrete, the rules of the discrete continuum correspondence, because that's how we just created this CLRC. Okay, but this CLRC, so created, also recovers the following space time. Okay, so the space time down below here, this one, oops, I can't highlight it. So that is the simplest possible plane fronted gravitational wave First, it's moving in the dead direction um, and it has a wave profile H U. H is non-zero only between, U is a, a null coordinate T minus Z and this H is only non-zero in the blue region between U is zero and U is one. Everywhere else, 
H is zero and the metric is flat. So it's flat outside the blue region. Inside the blue region, it's not flat. There is curvature. And we also choose H such that the integral of H over U, sorry, it's cut off. The integral of H du is zero. Okay, so all I need to, to because this is a, this space time is a perturbation of Minkowski space, the claim that, the claim that this, the CLRC must be embeddable in it, consistent with some, um, but the manifold is still just R4. It's the same manifold as before for this space time. The CLRC vertices can be embedded in R4 in the way that, in exactly the same way as, as, um, as the Minkowski space, the coordinates are the same coordinates, Tx, um, y, and z. And the, the only thing to check is that the geodesic lengths in this gravitational wave spacetime are approximately equal to the Minkowski space lengths. So in other words, this geodesic here, the one that goes between the origin and the point with coordinates um, one, zero, 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 that geodesic must have lengths approximately equal to one. And you go through all of the, there are 15 geodesics, uh, actually there are 15 geodesics to check in here, there are 15 geodesics to check in there because these are slightly different. Um, as you can see, the, the gravitational wave intersects the cube in different um, in a different way for one and two, um, but then that's repeated. So each, each hypercube after that which intersects this is either um, isometric to one or it's isometric to two. So there's only two, two cubes to check. 15 geodesics for each of them. You can calculate the geodesics, you can calculate their lengths. And if this condition here holds, then up to first order in the perturbation, if h is small, say it's of order epsilon, to first order in epsilon, the lengths are equal to the, um, the, the length decorations of the CLRC that, that um, we can, that we endowed them with um, from the from its Minkowski space origins. Okay. So, the thing about this space time is that, thank you, Simon, it is a physically nice GR space time. It looks in this frame as if the curvature is squashed into a region that thin that has physical dimensions of order the Planck length. And that would not be, that seems at first sight to violate the condition that this is a GR space time, one in which the curvature only varies slowly on Planckian scales. Okay. But that's a trick of the embed, it's a trick of the frame that I've chosen to illustrate this. Um, space time. It's not true. This void region, the region, the blue region, the region in which the space time has curvature, is large and physically nice. The width or height of a region can't be used as a measure of niceness in Lorentzian geometry because there are null directions. So the width of this, if I go in a null direction here, is zero. So instead, we, we need to be careful and clever about how we identify large, physically nice regions in, in Lorentzian space times. So here's a nice definition of a large, um, physically nice space time. It contain, a, a region is large and physically nice in the Lorentzian space time if it contains approximately flat um, causal diamonds of proper height something big compared with the Planck, um, with the Planck um, length. And I claim that this blue region here contains approximately flat causal diamonds of height one second. And Lorentz invariance is the key to seeing this. 
And to see it, we just do a Lorentz boost in the Z direction with a very large gamma factor. <laughs> so this is the gamma factor, which translates from one Planck time to one second. And if you boost the coordinates, if you re-express this space time in these boosted coordinates, T primed, Z primed, then the form of the gravitational wave is exactly the same, but now the range of the U of the null U coordinate is now one second or 10 to the 44 um, units of Planck time. Okay, so all you've done, so when you do, another way to think about this is that when you do a boost, it squashes things in one null direction and, it's, and stretches things in, another, in, the, in the transverse null direction. And what, you, what happens to this blue region when you do a boost is that it expands to, well, as large as you like, depending on how, how much you want to boost by. Okay. Let me contrast that then with the Euclidean case. So suppose we were to do all of this whole thing just for Euclidean space. In other words, R4 and the perturbation of R4, Euclid, four-dimensional Euclidean space. So we tried, we, we build this complex, we have the triangulation of R4, we build the complex that's based on the, on the integer lattice and the blah, blah, blah. Now, this void region, if this really were R4, if the geometry, Euclidean geometry, this void is not a physically nice region of Euclidean space time. It has physical structure. For example, its width is now a meaningful, physical um, measure of a geometrical quantity. So this, this width here is roughly a Planck length. And that makes this region physically not nice. It's, it has structure on Planckian scale. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't fall into the category of, of, of geometries that we need to recover. And no isometry of Euclidean space, no rotation. So, you, so now, we're in Euclidean space, we're not allowed to do Lorentz boosts, so we can, but we can do rotations. But if you rotate that, this non-niceness, this the fact that this space time now has structural and Planckian, um, Planckian scales doesn't change. So if you tried to do the same thing with this Euclidean R4, this um, complex as um, something that could underpin R4, if you tried to fill in this blue region with some kind of non-flat continuum geometry, then you would produce a space-time with geometry that varies on the scale of the discreteness. And that would be unphysical and you, would, you wouldn't want to, um, to get such a thing anyway. So in fact, this leads us to make a conjecture that in contrast to the Lorentzian case, in the Riemannian case, there is a discrete continuum correspondence for combinatorial Riemannian regio complexes that succeeds. That it is the case that discrete physical data can recover Riemannian geometries. That's a conjecture. I don't know whether it's true, but it, um, it's not. Um, the example that I've just shown you is no counterexample to this conjecture. So there's a, real, there's a really clear distinction between the Lorentzian case and the Riemannian case here. Okay. All right, what about alternate other discrete physical data sets? I've given you just one case. How can I claim that nowhere else in the literature is there a discrete physical data set that will do the job? Well, you can see what the problem here was. The problem was that in this, CLRC and in the embedding of that CLRC into Minkowski space, there were void regions, region, nice, physically nice regions, which had no vertices. And when there are large physically nice regions with no vertices or very few vertices, for example, then any discrete continuum correspondence that you might try to set up will fail because the discrete physical data set cannot recover Lorentzian, the Lorentzian geometry in the voids. However, if you demand in your discrete 
continuum correspondence for your theory X, that the number volume correspondence holds that you don't get voids, in other words, that for every region there you have enough vertices, enough data in that region, then you're back into causal set territory. And there's only one proposal for discrete physical data in the literature, which has which has this number volume correspondence in the discrete continuum correspondent. So you're back to cause it. So to try to solve the problem of the fact that you have voids in this attempt at making a discrete physical data set out of these out of these um, out of these simplicial complexes, you drive you're driven to driven back to causal sets. Okay. Now in view of time, I'm going to skip over the quantum stuff. And I will, uh, you can ask me in the questions. I'll just conclude. So I've given you an argument that, that no matter what X is fundamentally, if the assumptions hold, then at the, then at the point where a GR space time needs to be recovered, there is, there is at present no entity in the literature other than a causal set that can do the job of recovery that discrete physical data in a grounding state in X must do. And thank you very much for listening.